so uh, my topic today is to be speaking about linagliptin which is a gliptin which we are all quite familiar with and we have been using for a long time and while the SGLT2s and GLP1 receptor agonists are the stroke players in a cricket team you also need somebody who's a crafter who can hold on who can continue to perform year in year out and pull the patient out whether the situation is easy or difficult and that is kind of brief that, that lena glipton has because in a broad range of situations some difficult some easy some good playing conditions some bad playing conditions lena glipton maintains a same level of efficacy and simplicity which makes it a tried and tested molecule in this country and all across the world so which subgroup first comes to mind when you're thinking of a broad range of patients age group ethnicities comorbidities duration of diabetes and others so let us look at each of them in uh, separately and in conjunction with the data that we have with clinagliptin uh, shows a 1.2% reduction of hba1c which is 0.8% placebo corrected and which is statistically highly significant when you have a mean baseline hba1c of 9.5 now if you look at it in addition with metformin uh, with uh, metformin you find that there's a reduction of about 1.3 to 1.7% depending on the dose of metformin with hba1c of 8.7 and in an open label study you see a reduction of about 4% and this is very typical of any the anti diabetic drug because the higher you go the greater is the fall because a 4% reduction with linagliptin metformin if the hba1c is around 12%. So what about the broad range of therapies in effects the broad spectrum of diabetes initially starts off with monotherapy then we have to graduate to two three uh, two drugs then three drugs and then the patient starts requiring insulin and how does linagliptin fit into this you see that uh, in monotherapy about a 0.6 to 0.9% reduction of hba1c dual combination 0.5 to 0.65 per, uh, milligr percent reduction of hba1c and again this is about 0.6% 0.65% is the kind of cut off value all these studies are statistically highly significant uh, with a baseline of about 8% so this gets you into the target range of about 7% if you use it across the mode of treatment of early diabetes late diabetes and very late diabetes whether you're using it as a single drug dual drug triple drug or in combination with insulin what about patients who are obese non obese and slim so with slim there's a 3% reduction of hba1c uh, with bmi with normal with overweight patients 2.9 slightly obese 2.7 and more than uh, uh, very morbidly obese is 2.7 again now what this brings to the forefront that linagliptin and metformin combination can reduce hba1c e e equally across bmi and as you can see the p value of interaction is not significant which means that across all spectrum of bmi there is a similar amount of hba1c reduction about 2 with uh, uh linagliptin on its own and about 3 with linagliptin and uh metformin put together what about age and again this is a very emotive factor because a large portion of our population is getting older and older and as you can see there's a 0.6 to 0.8% reduction of hba1c between the age groups of 40 to 80 so whether the patient is young or whether the patient is old you will get a similar amount of hba1c reduction which is pretty robust at about 0.7% average which is got a p value of interaction of 0.6955 which means that it is not significant the difference is not significant and you get a similar reduction so all in all these things are starting to point towards only one thing the complete simplicity and the complete lucidity and the complete predictability of this drug which is regardless of all other factors which might be present now about time of diagnosis again about 0.6% reduction in early diabetes in mid diabetes and late diabetes 
the p-value of interaction is again not significant which means that it remains the same now this is 0 0.5 0 0.6 and 0 0.68 this is placebo corrected hba1c reduction so with placebo you get a little bit of deduction and this is over and above what you would get with uh, linagliptin moreover it is durable it is in patients who have had diabetes for more than 10 years, linagliptin continues to work. This is at 24 weeks, continue to see a reduction of 0.7% HbA1c. And a large percentage of these patients reach HbA1c target of 7% if their uh, HbA1c is between 7.5 to 8. If it's up to 9, again, about 50% will reach the target. And of course, in late diabetes, when we start to require insulin, and the HbA1c is point greater than 9, you will probably be needing insulin, but yet in that situation, about 12% of people with uh, linagliptin treatment will reach your target HbA1c. What about Indo-Asians, Blacks, Hispanic? All across the board, there's a similar A reduction of HbA1c when compared to placebo with a baseline HbA1c of about 8.5%. You can use it across degrees of renal function. This is the kind of thing that you see. Again, the p-value of interaction is not significant. About 0 0.5 uh, 5 to 0.7% reduction. This is a RCT in uh, very late kidney disease, but yet you'd see that the HbA1c reduction with linagliptin is maintained. And this in turn is uh, you know, magnified by the fact that in the Carmelina study, there was a reduction in albuminuria progression. So this is an added advantage of usage of linagliptin when compared to placebo. There's a 14% reduction in the, to the first occurrence of albuminuria with the usage of linagliptin when compared to placebo. Now, what happens to these patients in, in, uh, if they're being treated with uh, insulin or with any kind of um, oral hypoglycemic agents. And as you can see, there is a very large portion of people who reach a target HbA1c of less than 8%, about 40%, without getting any hypoglycemia over uh, the, about 24-week period, which is roughly about six months. And again, this is, uh, again, a double of what you would get with placebo reaching a target, not only of a reduction of HbA1c to less than 7%, and they achieved that without getting the hypoglycemia. So this is a large improvement that you see when you use it with insulin with no risk of increased hypoglycemia. It is extremely well tolerated. The risks are minimal, as you think. It's got placebo level risk. So in many times you hear about this drug being mentioned as a fill it, shut it, and forget it kind of drug. And... Um, Practical and beneficial effect aspects of linagliptin in simplifying diabetes management. Another very important aspect is it's a five milligram once daily small pill, and you can use it across a spectrum of disease, age, background, BMI, disease uh, duration, hepatic function, renal function, ethnicity, as I've just shown you. Now, this is particularly important in India, where a lot of our patients get lost to follow up. So it is uh, imperative that we put patients on drugs which are safe and can bear the intolerance of no follow-up over a prolonged period of time. And why can it be done that way? Because it is useful in kidney disease and liver disease, and also because it is in, administered once daily, because it has a high affinity, a high selectivity, tight binding to the receptor, and high potency and long duration of action. In addition, it has the lowest kidney excretion, only 5%, whereas sitagliptin has 87%, pindagliptin 85%, 76% for aloe and 75% for saxa, which is why all these drugs need dose adjustment with declining EGFR. This is something that we often fail to do, and there is data showing that if you fail to do it, there is a worsened outcome of the renal disease uh, in patients. It's a retrospective data from Japan. Um, but, you know, if you do not reduce dosage in drugs like sitagliptin when EGFR is de uh, declining, you can get adverse reactions as far as the kidney is concerned. This is probably the why that linagliptin is considered by many as the renal gliptin. It is the first D approved DPP-4 inhibitor that does not require dose reduction based on kidney function. 
as you can see, Citus, Axa, Wilda, and Allo will need dose reduction as the uh, uh, kidney disease progresses, but not so with linagliptin. So the additional benefit that you get with linagliptin is the publication of two car uh, cardiovascular outcome trials in the form of Paramodina and Carolina, one against placebo and the other against glimepiride. The one against placebo is the Carmelina trial, where patients had established cardiovascular disease and or CKD with HbA1c varying between 6.5 to 10%. This was in late diabetes. Carolina was against uh, glimepiride, in which patients were relatively early diabetes that increased CV risk, but not established CV disease, again, 6.5 to 8.5. And this was uh, probably a, 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 the Carmelina population had patients who were probably far sicker. But what it did provide us was an evidence base about the broad range of patients that you can be treated as far as the cardiovascular aspects is concerned with linagliptin. And the first thing that being the renal glyptin for many, the first thing we look at is the cardiovascular outcomes across the uh, GFR categories, and this is across a wide range of GFR from greater than 60 to less than 30. You find the diamond is right at the middle of the cent unity, so there is no change in 3P mace or hospitalization for heart failure or in the composite kidney outcomes of doubling of serum creatinine and uh, you know starting of dialysis or transplantation. So all these things mean that it continues to be used very safely in kidney disease, even in patients who are very sick. And the rates of hypoglycemia in patients who were on linagliptin is similar to that of placebo across GFR categories, which means that you can continue to use linagliptin with as much ease as you would use a placebo, whether the patient has normal renal function, has moderately disturbed renal function, or it is, com it is completely disturbed severe uh, uh, renal disease or end-stage renal disease. The CV and kidney safety profiles of linagliptin were consistent across age groups. Again, you see less than 65, 65 to 75, more than 75, the time to cardiovascular death or myocardial infarction or non-fatal stroke was the same as that of placebo. There was no increased risk of heart failure, probably some degree of benefit. As you can see, there's a 0.9, 10% uh, reduction of uh, uh, heart failure hospitalization, which was not statistically significant. And the kidney outcomes, again, as you can see, it's all in the center. No worsening, even though there is a change in age. So the similar evidence on overall the severe hypoglycemic events with in patients with Carmelina, as you can see, the efficacy or the any kind of thing didn't change. Yet the number of patients with hypoglycemia or severe hypoglycemia seems to be about the same in all kind of age groups with no worsening of hypoglycemia with increasing age. Now, what about Carolina, which was against glimepiride? 3P mace or the incidences of stroke, MI, or CV death was the same. Now, this is a difficult area because you have to remember this is in early diabetes. Diabetics start getting complications later on in the disease. It is in late diabetes that people start getting cardiovascular disease. So maybe this, this uh, program was conducted in uh, patients who did not have that kind of incidence of cardiovascular events. So this might be one reason why we don't see it. And there was no increase in heart failure, hospitalization, or CV death in the overall population in various age parameters. And also there was uh, one big difference, which was in the group which used glimepiride, as you would expect, there was a huge incidence of symptomatic and severe hypoglycemia, which was not seen in the group which used uh, linagliptin, whether it was in 65 years of age or more, whether it was in more than 75 or less than 65 years of age. So in Carolina, a higher proportion of patients achieved target HbA1c without hypoglycemia, weight gain, or 
breast tube medication with linagliptin compared with glimepiride, which was consistent across age groups and consistent across EGFR2. And the reason is very simple. The, one of the reasons is linagliptin does not cause hypoglycemia. Glimepiride being a sulfonylurea uh, leads to hypoglycemia and weight gain. Secondly, sulfonylurea are a group of drugs which are kind of pre-programmed to failure. So though they are very efficacious in the initial part, without fail, they will start to fail over a period of time. This is not something that we have noticed with drugs like linagliptin. So naturally, it produces a huge advantage in that regard. So linagliptin essentially helps simplify the management of diabetes as it is efficacious and not only efficacious when the patient is closer to the target, but even when patients have a high HbA1c. It is a established CV in kidney safety profile with two robust trials, which have been done not only against placebo, but against competitor. And it provides a very simple way to manage diabetes. It is the one that you can turn to that who will always be there with one dose once daily for a broad range of patients in different settings, whether it be the elderly, whether it be in kidney failure, whether it be in liver failure, it is there and you can use it safely without worry in all these situations, ensuring that compliance is maintained because it is just once a day. Thank you very much for bearing with me.